Hi guys, welcome to the May and August 2020 SES pre-scene reading. This session is mainly designed to help you going through the pre-scene material. I will be going through the entire pre-scene with very basic level of commentary. So you can use that as an initial baseline to be familiar. In addition to that, if you, are, if you have a tendency to be more of an auditory or someone who likes to listen, I hope that this reading will help you even while you're commuting, while you're traveling uh, on your headphones, you can listen in and get the basic idea of what's going on with the pre-scene assigned for the SEMA strategic case study, May and August 2020 examination. Let's get on with it. This is the first page of the document and as you can see, the typical content section is provided for you. Uh, you have contents, introduction, uh, micro mobility industry, runabout, extracts from the annual report, extracts from the competitor statements, runabout share price history, news stories and extracts from hoverboard users blog. Introduction is the first section. You are a senior manager in the finance function at runabout the parent company of Runabout Group. You report directly to the board and advise on special projects and strategic matters. Runabout is a quoted company that operates pay-as-you-go hoverboard vehicles for use by the public in major cities. Zealand is a large and prosperous country with a population of more than 1 billion people. Zealand's major cities have grown rapidly and many are struggling with the difficulties caused by traffic congestion and the resulting pollution. Runabout is based in Zealand where the currency is G dollars. Zealand requires companies to prepare their financial statements in accordance with international financial reporting standards. Zealand has an active and well regulated stock exchange. Companies that are quoted on the exchange are required to adhere to the Zealand Code of Corporate Governance, which sets out detailed regulations relating to the governance arrangements for quoted companies. So as you can see in this second page of the document, they give you a basic idea, basic, very basic snapshot of what the company is. The company's name is Runabout, uh, which is the parent company of Runabout Group. Um, you are the senior finance manager of the company. And they also give you a basic background about Zealand, which is the base country, which is the country Runabout is based in. So my suggestion is for you to thoroughly understand that you're operating in an environment which is uh, quite, you know, business savvy, business uh, quite helpful for a thriving business with a well-regulated stock exchange and also is governed by a code of corporate governance. The next section is dedicated to the micro mobility industry. Let's read it. Micromobility is a relatively recent innovation dating from the early 2000s. It involves the provision of one-way rental services that enable users to complete the so-called last mile of a journey quickly and efficiently. Micromobility users rent, say a bicycle, scooter or hoverboard from one location and return it to another location that is conveniently close to their final destination. Typically, users are commuters who need a fast and efficient way to get from, say, a city center railway station to their offices. Micromobility is generally used for relatively short journeys and so augments traditional public transport rather than replacing it. Commuters might be encouraged to travel into the city center by train or bus, knowing that micromobility solutions are available that enable them to get to work on time without walking long distances or relying on local bus or taxi services that are likely to be slow moving because of rush hour traffic. So here in these first couple of paragraphs, they're giving you a insight into what micro mobility is. And that mainly involves the final leg of a general workers, general commuters, general passengers travel journey. Say, for example, someone would be traveling from outskirts of a town to the city center in which uh, you will have your particular office. So from your home, you take a bus and you arrive at the city center and that last leg 
of your journey which is generally termed as the last mile even in the courier industry is in this case done by a personal mobility device PMD which is a bicycle scooter or hoverboard. The next section focuses on bicycle sharing. Bicycle sharing permits users who are registered with a provider to rent bicycles on a short term basis. The provider creates a network of bicycle docking stations or docks across a suitable location such as a city center. Users can release a bicycle from a dock by identifying themselves, usually by swiping a debit or credit card. They can use the bicycle for as long as they wish but are charged a higher fee from releasing the bicycle until it is returned to one of the provider's docks which may not be the dock from which the bicycle was taken. Providers locate docks in places which encourage one-way journeys. For example, city centre bus and railway stations make convenient pickup points for morning commuters. Docks close to major office buildings are convenient dropping off points. Users may then, if they wish, hire a bicycle for the first part of their return journey. Taking a bicycle from a dock close to their place of employment and dropping it off at the station from which they will catch their bus or train home. Bicycle sharing is a relatively cheap and convenient way to cover the so-called last mile of a journey to a city centre location. Cycling is generally faster than walking and can also be faster than a local bus service when rush hour traffic is taken into account. Bicycle hire charges for sharing schemes are generally inexpensive. While peak demand for bicycles occur during the morning and evening rush hours, there is a constant demand throughout the day and late into the evening. Students often use bicycle sharing schemes to travel between their accommodation and their college campuses. Tourists find them useful to explore cities and for transportation between attractions such as museums. Many cities have large numbers of flat dwellers who live within a few miles of the city center and who find it convenient to be able to use a bicycle sharing scheme to get to and from work and for short journeys outside of work. Bicycle sharing schemes came into being in the early 2000s. They have since grown and developed in many cities around the world. There has been some controversy about their use and they have also been subject to competition from other types of transportation. It is generally illegal to ride bicycles on pavements or in pedestrianized areas. Most countries' laws require cyclists to ride on designated bicycle lanes or on the roads when bicycle lanes are not available. Not surprisingly, increasing the numbers of cyclists on the roads increases the numbers of injuries involving cyclists. Strict legislation has been introduced to reduce the risks associated with riding bicycles owned by sharing schemes. Operators must ensure that bicycles are roadworthy. Most operators require users to return a bicycle to its dock immediately if they believe that it is defective and to inform the operator of the bicycle's status using an app, in which case the bicycle will not be released to another user. Operators generally employ mechanics who attend to simple repairs such as flat tires while the bicycle is still in its dock. For more serious repairs, the bicycles are transported to the operator's depot by van. In many countries including Zealand, cyclists are required to wear crash helmets. Bicycle sharing schemes have no specific responsibility for ensuring that cyclists comply with this law. But it does mean that scheme users must either purchase and carry helmets if they wish to hire a bicycle or they must risk being stopped by the police and fined for failing to wear a helmet. Bicycle sharing schemes continue to be popular in many countries and the number of trips made by users of those schemes is increasing steadily. There are however some competing modes of transport in this market. So as you can see in this section, the pre document focuses on the product or service which is very popular in the world called bicycle sharing. This is one of the most basic forms of micro mobility or personal mobility. The section goes on to detailing the dynamics of the 
entire service, how it's provided, how it's cheap and convenient, how it's steadily gaining momentum, what kind of as in students, tourists and flat dwellers are the kind of customer groups that frequently use it and also lays out the picture with respect to legislation and regulation and uh, also finally the kind of risks and in that final section the last sentence is about how there are some competing modes of transport in this market which means we are going to look at the alternatives to bicycle sharing or alternate services in personal mobility number one electric bicycles electric bicycles have battery powered motors that augments the user's pedaling and so require less effort many commuters prefer to use electric bicycles because of this the bicycle's batteries are automatically recharged while they are in the docking station so that's electric bicycles number two electric scooters Electric scooters are powered by batteries. They do not require any effort from their users. They are recharged while docked. They have proved controversial because they are often ridden on payments rather than on the road and have been involved in accidents involving pedestrians. That's electric scooters, number two. And finally, number three, which seems to be our product, hoverboards. Hoverboards are generally ridden on payments in a city context. They can be recharged while docked and used in a similar manner to electric scooters. Our boats are slower than electric scooters. All right. That brings us to what our particular product is runabout, which basically offers hoverboard sharing. But before we look into runabout itself, the pre scene allows us to understand what hoverboard sharing is and what kind of technicalities and what kind of detail we should be aware of. Hoverboard sharing. Hoverboards do not actually hover. They are two-wheeled vehicles that are driven by electric motors powered by rechargeable batteries. The user stands on a platform that fits between the two wheels. The hoverboard is controlled by the operator leaning in the desired direct direction of travel. A slight lean forward makes the machine roll ahead and leaning to the left or right makes the machine turn in that direction. Leaning backward will make the hoverboard slow down and reverse if the operator continues to lean in that direction after stopping. Hoverboards which are sometimes referred to as self-balancing scooters work as follows. So here we just learned how a hoverboard is used. Mainly it's by leaning toward the direction that you want to go. They are also known as self-balancing scooters. And now we have an image of what a hoverboard looks like and also the various components within the hoverboard. Let's take a look. Electric motors. Each wheel is powered by its own electric motor, which enables the hoverboard to steer. If the user wishes to turn left, then the right hand wheel spins a little faster, making the board turn left. The motors also prevent the board from tilting by more than a few degrees, even when it is standing still. So there's an electric motor. The second component is the computer. The electric motors are controlled by an onboard computer that is programmed to manage both stability and movement. Sensors in the platform provide the computer with inputs that keep the platform stable enough to stand on and that detect the user's control inputs to control speed and direction. So the computer seems to be playing a very important role in tandem with the sensors. The third component is the gyroscope. A gyroscope built into the platform enables the computer to measure the angle of the platform. The computer sends instructions to the wheels using feedback from the gyroscope to prevent the platform from, from tilting. Then the platform itself. The platform is strong enough to carry the weight of the user. It has to be. It carries the hoverboard's other components. It also contains pressure switches that measure the control inputs from the user. And finally, the battery. Hoverboards generally use 36 volt batteries, which provide sufficient power to ensure a satisfactory performance. The hoverboard's range is determined by the capacity of the batteries. So those are the five key components 
that we learned uh, within a hoverboard device. Moving on. Hoverboards come in different sizes depending on whether they are being sold as adult transportation or children toys. Adult hoverboards can reach speeds of approximately 10 miles per hour or 16 kilometers per hour. Although riding at full speed will quickly run down the battery. A fully charged hoverboard that is driven at the equivalent of a brisk walking pace can travel over 15 miles or 24 kilometers before running out of power. That's a reasonably long distance. Hoverboards trace their roots back to the launch of self-balancing scooters in the early 2000s. They captured the public's attention because they looked inherently unstable and yet they could be ridden with apparent ease because of a combination of ingenious engineering and electronics. Early hoverboards were too expensive for consumers to buy, but they quickly became established as a means of fast and efficient transportation for staff who needed to be mobile within areas populated by pedestrians. For example, security staff in theme parks, shopping malls and airports can respond to alerts quickly without having to rely on conventional vehicles that would be too large and could pose an unacceptable risk to the public. These hoverboards also enable the rider to see over pedestrians because the platform is a few inches above ground level. The hoverboards have other uses, such as giving first aiders and paramedics the ability to get to a casualty quickly or giving staff supervisors the ability to attend incidents or interact with staff spread across their areas of responsibility. The machines themselves require no training to operate. The rider simply must lean in the desired direction of travel and can regulate speed by leaning more to go faster and less to slow down. These machines are not however without their risks, especially if they are operated irresponsibly. They can generally travel faster than a brisk walking pace, so the rider may have to navigate around pedestrians. The user could fall off or strike an obstacle if riding carelessly and a collision with a pedestrian would be potentially serious because the combined mass of the hoverboard and its user would have significant momentum when traveling at speed. Hoverboards are generally designed to operate on smooth surfaces such as pavements and tiled floors. They cannot be ridden safely on roads because their wheels could catch in potholes and drains. They would also be vulnerable to motor vehicles and would force passing cyclists away from the curb and into the paths of larger and faster vehicles. Hoverboards have also raised safety risks associated with their batteries overheating and bursting into flames. Hoverboards require both high voltages and high currents in order to ensure that the platform remains stable and achieves an accept acceptable speed. Loose connections can result in a short circuit that causes the battery to overheat and possibly catch fire. In extreme cases, rough handling of a battery can crack the battery's case, creating the risk of an explosion if the electrolyte is released and comes into contact with the air. Batteries are vulnerable to damage if hoverboards are ridden carelessly or if they are mistreated in use or storage. And now we arrive at the company's section. But before that, just a quick summary on what we looked at. We looked at the hoverboard sharing as a service itself. We understood what different components the hoverboard is made up of. We looked at the kind of uh, variations of the product, its capacity, its speed. We looked at the kind of users to it, what kind of customer groups like security staff, paramedics, first aiders, staff supervisors who use the hoverboard, that it became very popular, very fast, even though there were sort of, uh, you know, uh, there were uh, worries about adopting the hoverboard when it was introduced to the market initially. And uh, we also take a look at the kind of conditions of uh, which is suitable for a hoverboard. And furthermore, in this final paragraph, we looked at the kind of risks associated to the batteries, which could overheat or which could short circuit or which rough handling.
can cause major problems which means there are risks associated for using the hoverboard in terms of safety now the point about safety brings me to this i'm sure you have checked it out but i just want to take a look at some of these uh, clips that are on the internet uh, they're really funny and you also understand how dangerous hoverboards can be so before we check the runabout related sections in the pre-scene let's take a look Whoa, board's gone. Gone. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> All right. How's this? Oh, whoa. Oh, well, uh, not so. Whoa. <laughs> oh my god. All right. It's done. <laughs> Oof. That must have hurt. <laughs> oh. oh my god. <laughs> Look, these things seem to be very dangerous. Right? of clears it up for us now let's take a look at runabout runabout was uh, established in 2005 the company was created to rent bicycles in response to the successful launch of city center bicycle sharing schemes that had been launched in several other countries the company started with three docks in the center of Jilan's capital city it rapidly expanded until it had a total of 32 docks across capital city and a significant presence in 14 other cities across the country. Runabout was quoted on the Jilin Stock Exchange in 2010. In 2012, Runabout's board commissioned a strategic review of the market for micromobility in Jilin. The directors were concerned that demand for sharing schemes based on conventional bicycles was tailing off because commuters were becoming unwilling to rely on pedal power for even short distances. Zealand is a relatively flat country, remember that, so cyclists do not have to contend with many hills, but the weather can be rather windy, which can make cycling quite tiring. On an experimental basis, Runabout modified some of the docks in capital city to operate both electric and conventional bicycles that enabled users to choose between pedal driven and electric, electric bicycles with a slightly higher rental fee for electric, electric bicycles to cover the cost of recharging batteries. The docks were located to enable users to use electric bicycles on frequently used routes. Runabout also replaced all of the docks and bicycles in western city so that users could use electric bicycles across the whole of, this, of that city's network. Runabout found that the introduction of electric bicycles did little to stimulate demand. In 2014, the government of Zealand introduced legislation to make it mandatory to wear helmets while cycling that reduced demand for both pedal-driven and electric bicycles. The company experimented with various schemes such as offering to sell scheme members helmets at discounted prices. The new helmet legislation coincided with the launch of two competing bicycle sharing schemes in Zealand. Both of Runabout's new competitors focused their attention on capital city but soon started to expand into other towns and cities. These competitors grew steadily. In 2016, Runabout replaced it by its bicycles with hoverboards in western city. The docks that had previously been used to secure bicycles were replaced with hoverboard compatible docks. These were an immediate success. 
with hoverboards quickly becoming popular with many commuters because they required even less effort to ride than electric bicycles. They also opened up new markets with hoverboards proving popular with tourists who found them an ideal way to explore a city, either individually or as part of a guided tour. They are particularly suitable for tours of seafronts in coastal resorts because they are generally flat and offer wide paved areas that are free of traffic. Hoverboards also proved popular with shoppers who could park at the edge of a city center and use a hoverboard to get to the shops. Runabout was encouraged by these results and so replaced bicycles with hoverboards across Zealand. Runabout moved quickly to establish its hoverboard sharing scheme in capital city and in each of the other 14 cities in which it previously operated as a bicycle sharing operator. The other bicycle sharing companies continue to rent out both pedal and electric bicycles, but none have expressed any interest in converting to hoverboards or other forms of micro mobility. The city authorities have made it clear that they wish to observe the effects of hoverboards on the flow of pedestrians and traffic in city streets and also on the safety implications of these devices. Each of the 15 cities in which Runabout operates, including Capital City, has announced that it will not permit any other hoverboard sharing schemes on its streets, leaving Runabout as the sole provider for the foreseeable future. All of those cities will, however, continue to encourage the development of bicycle sharing. Wow. In Zealand, the responsibility for the management of road and pedestrian safety is a matter for individual town and city councils. The elected local government authorities responsible for many services including transport. So the individual town and city councils seem to be made up of the elected local government authorities. Moving on, companies that wish to offer any form of public transport, including micromobility services, must be licensed by the appropriate town or city council. Runabout employs 15,000 people. Oh, that's massive. Including 2,000 planning and analysis staff at its head office. The company's experience of providing micromobility services has given it a deep understanding of the flow of pedestrians through city centers. That understanding extends to the interaction between micromobility and different forms of public transport. To the extent that town and city councils have sought advice about transportation services from Runabout on a consultancy basis. Runabout has a total of 30.27 million registered users. Registration requires the user to create an account on Runabout's secure website and to download a mobile phone app. Registration is free, but all hoverboard rides are charged to the user's credit card. When creating an account, users must provide their 16-digit credit card number accompanied by their 3-digit credit card validation number, which is the CCV. Users can use the app to locate the nearest runabout dock that has available hoverboards. Alternatively, users can walk to convenient docks in the hope that there will be sufficient hoverboards available. Each dock has a four digit location number. Each user logs, on, logs into the app using an individual pin number and then inputs the location number of the dock from which they wish to hire a hoverboard. Runabout central server verifies the user's account and sends a five digit one time code to the user's phone. The user keys the one time code into the dock and the dock releases a hoverboard. The app can locate nearby docks to which a hoverboard can be returned or the user can simply write to a known dock. The user activates the dock using the phone app and is directed to place the hoverboard in a bay at street level. That brings the hire period to an end and the cost is charged to the user's credit card. The mechanism inside the dock interrogates the electronic self-diagnosis software on the hoverboard's computer. The hoverboard is taken out of service and is set aside for collection by a mechanic if it reports any mechanical or electrical failures. Otherwise, 
it is docked and charged ready for hire by the next user. Runabout's mechanics must collect and relocate hoverboards throughout the day in response to capacity in the docks and availability of hoverboards. On a typical weekday, 43% of all hoverboard hires occur during the rush hour periods of 7 to 9 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. During the morning rush hour, many hoverboards are undocked from bus and railway stations and redocked in city center locations close to places of employment. The opposite is true of the evening rush hour. Runabout uses vans to relocate hoverboards from docks that are close to being full up to docks that are in danger of running out of hoverboards. That ensures that users can rely on finding an available hoverboard that can be redocked close to their final destination. Runabout's vans also uplift faulty hoverboards for repair. The average hire period for one of Runabout's hoverboards is 22 minutes. The revenue and cost associated with a typical hire is as follows. So as you can see here, they give you a breakdown of average revenue per ride and average operating cost per ride. So as you can see here, if you take a closer look at average revenue per ride, what is visible is that there's a $1.4 initial higher charge which seems to be like a fixed cost and then a $0.2 per minute for an average of 22 minutes which is why they say that on average the higher period of one of the hoverboards is 22 minutes if you look at the average operating cost per ride it's slightly above $2 uh, with a massive depreciation portion electricity relocation costs, repairs, insurance, and the credit card fee. So when you do the financial review, when you do the numerical analysis for these numbers, I'm sure you can derive certain observations, certain analysis, certain, um, you know, key, key ideas about how the company breaks even, what their margin of safety is, etc., etc. Let's continue our reading. The average revenue per journey is G5.8 dollars and the average cost to runabout is G dollars 2.19. The software in runabout's hoverboards restricts the maximum speed of travel to 6 miles per hour, approximately 10 kilometers per hour. That is faster than a typical brisk walking pace of 3 to 4 miles per hour. The hoverboards could travel at much greater speeds but runabout is concerned that a higher speed would lead to more accidents. Runabout requires users to be at least 18 years old and to have a valid car driver's license. Although there is no legal requirement for users to be of a minimum age or to hold an official driving license, runabout's insurers would charge more in the absence of those requirements. Runabout is insured both against claims arising from injury to users and damage to their property and public liability insurance that covers injury or property damage to third parties. So very extensively insured. The insurance cost stated above refers to the insurance cover provided to users with respect to any injury caused by the user to a third party or damage to third party property. This cover applies automatically for the duration of any valid hire by a user. Runabout also incurs significant cost for insurance against claims made against the company by users or by third parties for injury or property damage. Looks like that's an area that you need to keep an eye on. To date, all of Runabout's hoverboards have been purchased from Minering Robotics a major manufacturer of industrial equipment based in Deland, not our country. Deland is a country that is strongly associated with excellence in engineering. Minering has no connection with Runabout other than as a supplier. Runabout selected Minering's hoverboard because it was a robust design that had been designed for use in factories as personal transportation for security staff and supervisors. When ridden carefully on flat surfaces such as tiled or concreted floors, 
Minerings hoverboards could you could be used for 40 hours a week for up to six months before they had to be replaced. The average depreciation charge of G0.74 dollars per ride is based on estimates of life expectancy provided by Minering. Minering sells its hoverboards to a wide range of customers around the world, although Runabout is the only customer who uses them to facilitate shared hoverboard services. Minering hoverboards are used extensively in industrial and retail settings. For example, many security departments equip their officers with minering hoverboards for patrol and fast response duties. All right, not bad. Now we move to the section on extracts from Runabout's annual report. Runabout's vision, mission and values. Vision to keep Gland moving. All right. Mission Runabout's mission is to offer an economical and efficient approach to micro mobility. We wish to harness both new and existing technologies to enrich our users' lives while creating wealth for our shareholders. Values. So Runabout seems to have four major values. Value number one, Runabout will provide users with safe and convenient transportation. Value number two, Runabout will minimize the environmental footprint of its micro mobility solutions. Value number three, Runabout will protect the safety and dignity of its employees. And the final value, value number four, Runabout will engage with stakeholders to the mutual benefit of all. So here we basically see that in the four values, they focus on the user, the environment, the employees, and largely the entire society looking at the mutual benefit of all stakeholders. Runabout's board of directors. So from an overview perspective, you have the organizational chart. There seems to be a CEO May Yi and four executive directors, uh, operations director, HR director, CFO and IT director. And the non-executives are made up of four members. You have the chairman and three non-executive directors and the committee participation is also provided. Let's take a look at each of them. Jack Avery is the non-executive chairman. Jack is a retired business executive who was CEO of Capital City Buses, which operates an extensive network of buses across Greater Capital City. During his period of leadership, Capital City Buses increased the number of buses in service by 22%. Jack was appointed by Runabout in 2017. May Yi is the Chief Executive Officer. May worked as a senior logistics manager in a courier company in Zealand for 16 years. He then joined Runabout in 2018. Joe Pateros, Chief Financial Officer. So we seem to be a senior financial manager. We will basically be working a lot with this CFO, Joe Pateros. Joe was a senior accountant with an electric scooter manufacturer before he was appointed to Runabout's board. He is a qualified accountant. Thank God. Geo was appointed in 2019. Then we have Alan Peters, who is the director of operations. Alan is a traffic engineer by training. He worked for Western City Council for 20 years, working on a range of responsibilities, including road planning and public transport management. Alan joined Runabout's board in 2015. Then we have the IT director, Sean McDougall. Sean has held a number of senior positions in major quoted companies, including gaming companies. He enjoys a challenge and was delighted to join the board in 2018. Then we have Pat Olly, the human resources director. So Pat has held senior HR roles in a number of organizations. He joined Runabout as Human Resource Director in 2017. Marco Palemo, Independent Non-Executive Director. So Jack Avery is the Non-Executive Chairman. Now we have Marco Palemo, 
Marco is a qualified accountant who was a partner in one of Jilan's leading accountancy firms before he retired from full-time employment. Marco was appointed to Runabout's board in 2017. Juliana Liang, Independent Non-Executive Director Juliana founded a successful transport company. She retired in 2013 and was appointed to Runabout's board in 2016. Patrick Chiu, Independent Non-Executive Director Patrick was a senior manager in Jilan's health service, specializing in financial management. All right. He was appointed to Runabout's board in 2017. So, as you can see, Alan Peters as the Director of Operations uh, collaborates with city authorities, management of docks and hoverboard fleet and legal issues. So maybe we can take apart the legal issue and maybe bring in someone else who is an expert in that area. Oh, I hope Alan Peters is an expert enough. It's seemingly a little too much responsibility. We'll see. Uh, Pat Olley, who is a human resource director, is in charge of staff recruitment and training. Also health and safety. Gio Patros, senior, senior, uh, chief financial officer, uh, is in charge of management accounting, financial reporting and treasury function. Sean, who is the IT director, is in charge of maintenance and update of all operating software and apps. IT security and continuity. All right. And all of them report to Mei, who is the CEO. If you look at the uh, independent committees, we have the risk committee, audit committee, and remuneration committee. Uh, the risk committee members are two. No, we have uh, how many? We have three members in the risk committee. We have uh, Marco Palemo. We have Jack Avery and we have Patrick Chiu. If you take the audit committee, again, three members, we have Marco Palemo, Jack Avery and Juliana Liang. And the remuneration committee has another three members who is, uh, well, it's made up of Patrick Chiu, uh, Juliana Liang and Jack Avery. So Jack seems to be a member of all the committees here. There is a committee in corporate governance that I would prefer to have in this case, which we could be looking at when we analyze the pre-scene from a corporate governance angle. That's something for you to think about. Can you bring in another committee here? And Jack's role in all of these committees. We might need a little more clarity there. Moving on, runabouts principal risks extracted from annual report. So basically the risk register. You have uh, basically three columns here, risk theme, risk impact and risk mitigation. The first risk theme is safety. As I showed to you in the videos, a hoverboard or using a hoverboard doesn't seem to be the easiest thing to do. Anyway, uh, under safety, the risk impact and risk mitigation considerations. The first one, hoverboards can cause injury and property damage when ridden irresponsibly. For mitigation, users must be at least 18 years old and hold a driver's license before they can register as users. Second risk impact, hoverboards can injure pedestrians because they travel at relatively high speed on pavements and in pedestrianized areas. Risk mitigation, runabout has comprehensive insurance cover for both injury and property damage. The third one, Hoverboards are powered by high capacity rechargeable batteries that can be prone to catching fire or exploding. They are particularly dangerous when dismantled or handled roughly. The mitigation measure taken is that all employees are fully trained in the safe handling of hoverboards. The hoverboards themselves have a self-diagnostic sensor that can provide warning of problems with electrical connections and battery temperature. Not bad. So that's the first risk theme, safety. Next is regulation and licensing. Runabout requires the permission of city authorities in order to locate docks in convenient locations and offer the hire of vehicles for use on public payments and pedestrianized areas. If that permission is withdrawn by any given city, then operations would have to cease. The mitigation is that runabout maintains strong communication links with the local authorities. 
Runabout's board takes care to ensure that any concerns raised by the authorities are addressed as a matter of priority. Of obviously, wouldn't you say? Third risk theme is competition. Runabout has to compete with other providers of micro mobility services as well as traditional public transport, taxi and ride sharing services. So a lot of competition. Competitors may take advantage of developments in technology and may receive subsidies from the government or city authorities. The mitigation is that Runabout is the only provider of shared hoverboards in the cities in which it operates. Kind of a monopoly. That has a number of advantages. Hoverboards are the only vehicles that can be ridden on payments and so do not expose users to the risks of riding on the roads. They are also unaffected by delays caused by heavy traffic. The next theme under risk, uh, of the risk register is IT, which seems critical. The first risk impact factor is that runabout's operations are wholly dependent upon the availability of its servers and users access to mobile phone networks in order to operate their apps. How do they mitigate that? The servers are backed up to a remote hot backup site. So if you remember, there are a few types of backup sites. They have a hot backup site that can take over in the event of the main site becoming unavailable. Mobile phone networks rarely go out of service. Those rare outages that do occur rarely affect more than one service provider. So it would be unlikely to prevent all users from hiring hoverboards. The second risk impact under IT is runabouts files contain sensitive data about users, including credit card details and the location of users when they hire and return hoverboards. Runabout ensures to mitigate that, runabout ensures that its servers are secure. Staff are subject to background checks to ensure that they are trustworthy before they are granted access to users data. And finally, we have Runabout's internal audit charter before we move into the financial statement section. This one is quite detailed and uh, is very self-explanatory considering Runabout's process when it comes to internal audit. Internal audit is overseen by Runabout's audit committee. The chief internal auditor reports to Marco Palermo, the convener of the audit committee. The chief internal auditor is responsible for the management and organization of internal audit staff. Internal audit investigations will be conducted in accordance with appropriate professional audit standards. The members of the internal audit department are granted unrestricted access to any records locations and assets that they deem necessary in order to discharge their duties. They are, they are also free to interview all staff and have a right to receive full cooperation whenever they do so. Audit staff will submit a written report to the chief internal auditor at the conclusion of each audit investigation. The chief internal auditor will provide the convener of the audit committee with a summary of all audit reports in addition to copying the full reports to the convener. Then the internal audit reports will be used to provide feedback to managers who are responsible for the areas subject to audit. Where exceptions are noted, the managers responsible will agree a plan for rectification and the internal audit staff will ensure that agreed changes are implemented. An internal audit plan will be developed each year and approved by the audit committee. The plan will focus on areas identified using a risk based approach. So I'm sure the risk register will come in handy there. The chief internal auditor will seek authorization from the convener of the audit committee before deviating from the plan. The audit committee has the authority to require revisions to the plan or to request special investigations that are deemed necessary. And that brings us to the financial statements, which is not something I will be looking at here, 
but they are providing us with the runabout group's consolidated statement of profit and loss uh, for the year ended 31st December, the statement of changes in equity. You have the consolidated statement of financial position. And also, for comparison purposes, we have a major competitor. Runabout is the only provider of hoverboard sharing services in Zealand, but it is not the only provider of micro mobility services. Dockbike operates an electric bicycle sharing scheme in capital city and five other major cities. So if you remember, Runabout seems to be the much larger company and operations, even in terms of revenue. You just take a quick look at revenue. We have in 2019 reported 97.9 billion G dollars and uh, Dockbike's revenue is uh, about 28.4 billion. So they are relatively a smaller company. In fact, when you look at their scale of operations, capital city and five other major cities, so six cities. Meanwhile, Runabout operates in 15 cities. Uh, Dockbikes, PNL, and uh, the financial consolidated statement of financial position is also provided. You have Runabout share price history. A quick look at it. Well, we have had a had our biggest low during August. 2019 it seems like but we have continuously the share price has rallied during the past few months uh, and we have a all-time high at least uh, considering the trailing 12 months which is good news looks like uh, runabout's geared beta is 1.33 and its ungeared beta is 1.21 all right sure this brings us to the news stories so we have a few news stories Let's go through them one by one. The first one is from Zealand Daily News. Headline Hoverboard Ankle Concerns Doctors. Hospital emergency rooms have reported a steady increase in the number of ankle injuries caused by hoverboard users crossing roads by jumping off the curb at maximum speed. This affects children playing with toy hoverboards near their homes and adults using larger hoverboards in city centers. When hoverboards are ridden like this over time, the springs that absorb the impact of jumping from the pavement down to the road weaken and sometimes even break. That puts users at risk of injury because the impact is then absorbed by their ankles, leading to sprains and broken bones. Doctors blame the increase in injuries on the fact that users are becoming more confident in their riding ability and are taking greater risks. Runabout, the shared hoverboard provider, advises its users that hoverboards should never be ridden over obstacles such as curbs. If users need to cross the road, they should either do so using a pedestrian crossing that has a lowered curb or wait until the road is clear and carry their hoverboard to the opposite side. The second news item is from IT Monthly. Dockbike CIO criticizes the lack of qualified graduates. Titus Mohubedu, Chief Information Officer at Dockbike, Zealand's largest bicycle sharing service, spoke out against the many irrelevant degree courses in IT that are offered by some universities. In his opinion, many IT degrees are far too theoretical and pay insufficient attention to the real world issues that matter to IT managers. He was speaking at the launch of the collaborative degree course that Dockbike was sponsoring at the University of Capital City. This combines academic study with structured practical experience at Dockbike's data centers. It is hoped that the course will attract 150 students each year, most of whom will work for Dockbike when they graduate. Mr. Mobedu pointed out that many service providers, including Dockbike and similar entities, were wholly dependent upon the efficiency of their IT infrastructure. He said that Dockbike employed more staff in IT than it did in maintaining and servicing its bicycles. Dockbike's IT spend amounts to 14% of its total operating costs. Very progressive, I believe. 
The third news item from the Jilan Telegraph we have is a business news which headlines banks criticize credit card customers. A recent report by the banking industry has demonstrated that many credit card customers took a very careless view of the security features that are built into their cards. The two largest issuers have more than 500 million card holders between them. So that could represent a significant exposure to fraudulent transactions. Typical cardholder errors include physical security, which is the first point. There are four points here. So typical cardholder errors include physical security. Many cardholders leave their wallets and purses in plain sight in their homes, which means that burglars can steal their credit cards along with the other data that can be used to validate a telephone payment such as their dates of birth and postal addresses. Second one is failing to sign the signature strip on the back of their card. Very important. Those signatures are rarely examined, but they are there to help confirm the cardholder's identity and there is no need to make life easy for a thief. The third one is carelessness. With the three digit security number on the back of the card, Contrary to popular belief, the 16-digit number on the front of the card is rarely sufficient on its own to validate an online or telephone payment. But having the extra three digits is often sufficient to validate a payment. Writing down the PIN number. It is commonplace for cardholders to carry a piece of paper with their personal identification number, PIN, in their wallet or to have their PIN number written in their diary. Very dangerous. The banks have warned that their losses from credit card fraud are unsustainable and that cardholders who are careless may be held liable for some or all of any unauthorized charges made against their accounts. Got to be careful. And then we come to the fourth news item from the Jilan Telegraph. Bicycles, bicycles make city streets safer for all. A research study published by the University of Western City suggests that micromobility was changing the nature of accidents involving pedestrians. There is a strong negative correlation between the numbers of bicycles and the number of pedestrians being knocked down by motor vehicles. That has been attributed to the traffic calming effects of motorists driving more slowly because of their difficulties of overtaking groups of cyclists safely. There have been fewer cases of pedestrians being knocked down by motor vehicles while crossing the road. Unfortunately, the payments themselves are becoming increasingly dangerous because of hoverboards. The danger is that pedestrians who step to the side to let hoverboards pass are at risk of stepping into the paths of bicycles that are approaching silently from behind. Overall, there is no evidence that city streets are becoming more dangerous, but all road and payment users are reporting an increase in the perceived risk of traveling at busy times. Wow. So, this article is more in favor of bicycles, huh? And the final news item, the fifth one, again from the Jilan Telegraph, we have is headlined, City Councillor Clashes with Transport Minister. A row has broken out between Jilan's transport minister and the councillor who is responsible for oversight of the Capital City Street Safety Department at Capital City Council. The dispute is over the need for regulation of the siting of docks to support micromobility schemes on city streets. The transport minister who is responsible for governing transportation at a national level wishes to impose more stringent rules relating to the maximum size of docks and the minimum distance from roads. The city councillor ob objects on the grounds that city councils should retain the power to decide such matters, taking account of the needs of local pedestrians and local traffic conditions. This debate is unlikely to be resolved soon. There are important democratic principles at stake, which are not helped by the fact that the ruling party in charge of Capital City Council is not the same as the party in charge of Jilan's National Parliament. Oh. 
So even in Zealand, there seems to be a lot of trouble going on these days, just like what's going on in the world. And final section is something that we've continuously seen in the recent precinct documents, extracts from someone's blog, in this case, Winey Turners. So I believe there are three blog posts. Let's go through them one by one. All the blog posts are also included with a couple of comments. Number one is titled Personal Best. So Wahini Turner says, I had my fastest run yet from the railway station to my office. I hired a trusty runabout hoverboard as usual and by luck the payments were quieter than usual. It only took me 18 minutes to get to the dock outside the office instead of the usual 20 minutes or more. Admittedly, the hoverboard felt pretty hot when I redocked it. That must be why the machine was making that beeping noise when I was pushing it hard up the slight incline to the junction with Harper Street. Well, the comments. I think the beeping noise means that the battery is overheating. <laughs> I don't think that runabout can complain if we push their machines hard because we pay by the minute. Shaving two minutes off your run would save you a fair amount over a week. Street surfer says. Wow, okay. <laughs> uh, whiny, we should race one day. There's rubber burner. My god, race on the hoverboards, huh? Right, so that's the first blog post. The second one is titled Warm Jumper. I had my first serious incident today, trying to get back to the station in time to catch that early train. I had to cross Pike Street and was heading for the pedestrian crossing when the road cleared. Rather than risk getting caught at the lights, I turned and jumped the hoverboard I was riding from the pavement down to the road. I've made that maneuver many times, but the payment was higher than I had expected and I hit the road with a crash. I managed to stay upright, but the hoverboard's platform was badly broken and it would have been crazy to have tried to ride it like that. I ended up carrying the hoverboard to the nearest dock and returning it. The battery was really hot, although I wasn't riding all that hard. <laughs> After you jump it. Needless to say, I missed my train. My god. Poor hoverboard. Let's look at the comments. You might get a letter from runabout. They will know that you were the last person to ride that hoverboard unless somebody else is stupid enough to take it out in that condition. My advice is to say that it was like that when you hired it. Sad Eric says. And uh, Throttle Master says, I think that you were lucky. The hoverboard probably had a short circuit after the crash and that made it overheat. You could have been burned. Well, and the final blog post, putting on weight. Says, uh, I left for the station at the same time as a colleague today. We like to race to the station and it is usually a good contest because there is rarely more than a few seconds between us. Tonight my colleague forgot that he was wearing a rucksack full of books that he had collected for charity. It must have weighed at least 30 kilograms. Anyway, he couldn't understand why he was unable to keep up with me. When I told him that runabout has a 95 kilogram weight limit, which is highlighted during runabout's initial registration process. He said that he weighs only 80 kilograms. He couldn't understand that he had to count the weight of his rucksack too. Wow. These are the kind of customers we have, huh? Comments. Runabout says that the maximum weight is 95 kilograms, but it is probably okay to exceed that by 5 kilograms or so. Your colleague almost certainly overloaded the hoverboard to breaking point. He was lucky not to have lost a wheel or broken the platform because falling off a hoverboard while traveling at 6 miles per hour will always be unpleasant. Boy Racer. Thank you Boy Racer for saying that. And that marks the end of the pre-scene reading with basic commentary. As you can see, we have nearly uh, 20 odd pages and we already had seen SEMA conducting its May 2020 strategic case study exam. But I hope that in this case, this reading will help you to basically just 
go through the content use it as a tool if at all if it helps you especially if you are as i earlier said an auditory person to go through the content and annotate it mark down write down your notes write down any additional observations that you make before you go to the strategic review or strategic analysis of the pre-seen document and that marks the end of the basic commentary video of the pre-seen analysis if you have any thoughts make sure that you comment you can connect with me all the links to my linkedin facebook and the of course the channel is right there below in the description section make sure that you write to me connect with me on gmail or comment below with any specifics that you would like to know about the strategic case study you can uh, contact me and join my sessions even so therefore until we meet again happy study see you folks all the best.